Do you ever have one of those weeks where uh, you uh, you get a fire drill um, and you know that for the rest of the uh, that week you're going to be on coals, and then somehow a week or two later you wake up on Monday, you rub your eyes, and you say, what the hell just happened? That's pretty much been the, uh, the last couple of weeks uh, for a lot of us here, um, and uh, less so for, for, for some than others. Um, but, you know, as the last panel was talking about, the... Uh, the industry will be determined by the people that weather this storm. Um, I think what we're interested in on this panel is both what's not working, what hasn't been working in the last few weeks, what else might break, and then finally what we can do uh, to fix it. And so on that note, um, I want to start by talking about what the biggest challenge over the last couple of weeks have been. Um, what problems with infrastructure have been revealed. Um, and I'd like to start uh, talking about data. And Kinga, I think you're the, uh, the right person to talk about that. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I think the last few weeks we've seen pretty much of a cleansing in the industry, right? So um, especially starting with DeFi, um, the, the market is very early at this stage, right? And there's not a lot of transparency and not a lot of understanding around what is going on. When we're talking about data, we're not just talking about data at the output level of interest rates and where things are going and liquidity. We're talking about the protocol level, which is very different from TradFi. In TradFi, we used to kind of just looking at the numbers and, and have an understanding of of what the quality of the information is, whereas in, in crypto, it's a lot more complicated. We have 24 seven markets, ultra complexity around when, you know, which, which exchange does what, and, you know, kind of couple that with DeFi, you can see that there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear, a lot of, a lot of just not knowing going on. So I think in the last few weeks, people probably realized that we need a lot more transparency a lot more understanding of, of what is going on in these protocols, what does, this, what does protocol even mean, and the retail customers have the understanding around how, where can they go, where can they get the right information. So that's really my take on it. Where to go, right. And then uh, Camilla, I wonder if we can talk a little bit about um, some of the difficulties that, uh, that have arisen, arisen because of people just not being able to trust some of the institutions that, uh, that are part of our infrastructure. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's uh, an interesting irony, I think, in digital assets, which is supposed to be trustless and decentralized, that trust is an enormous factor in, in the industry. Um, I don't think we've talked much about regulation yet today, and I think there's uh, a lot of companies operating in a very gray area from a regulatory perspective. So speaking for Anchorage, we firmly planted ourselves in, in as clear an area as you can and become a bank. Um, but I think it's very difficult for institutions to know who to trust when, when companies are operating in, in these difficult gray areas um, from a regulatory perspective. Um, and again, to your point about transparency as well, I think, again, most of the companies you deal with in crypto are private companies, they're early stage startup companies, um, and they will certainly disclose some information, but I think it's difficult to understand exactly how a company's operating. Um, if, if they're not a public company, you don't have to make certain disclosures as well. So I think just again doing, you know, very deep operational due diligence, whatever you're using a service provider for is, is really important. Right, right. And then John, you, you come from, in some ways, a, uh, a very traditional due diligence background um, and so are perfectly equipped to be able to evaluate institutions at a time like this. What are you doing? What are you seeing? What are you seeing that's not working? We started doing operational due diligence in the digital asset space about five years ago. Um, we've been on site or ages, we, ages in the uh, digital yeah. asset space. Um, when it was predominantly a uh, long only and crypto winter sh showed it to be long and wrong environment. Um, and uh, we've reviewed somewhere between 100 and 200 managers, I guess, over the last few years. I think you see a lot of things that there's a thread that's been going through some of the conversations this morning talking about going from a, from a, a high net worth or, or a retail market into an institutional market um, or the early days of crypto when it was viewed to be, you know, sort of a pirates with a saber in their teeth going after the world and it's slowly becoming institutional but there are still certain um, 
anchors in, in the world of, of non-institutional things like privacy coins and mixers, they exist for only one group of reasons and they would never be acceptable reasons in the traditional alternative space. Um, you have rules and regulations about uh, stable coins uh, or, or let's say money markets that stable coins don't follow that you would say, wait a minute, how is it that people put a billion dollars in it and somehow you don't actually have a billion dollars? So, so there are some of these core principles that seems that in the crypto space didn't learn from the bad actions of the traditional space and they're being relearned again. And um, what we're seeing is sort of um, areas of excessive risk or areas of excessive exuberance or areas when they didn't follow best practices are being revealed. Yeah. So it's just a classic over leverage and uh, you know, too little assets to go to support the strategy. And this is going to come out really wrong, but I deal, I, I'll give my best shot. Um, when I'm on site with the managers, some of them are really brilliant people. Brilliant technology people, brilliant um, financial minds, but many of them are young, and, and many of them don't seem to, when you say, well, what you're doing is very similar to this other fraud that we saw, and they look at you with a blank stare like, I don't know what you're talking about, that was like 10 years ago. And, and, and I'm like, well, I've been doing this for more than 10 years, so, so you actually, there's a reason why you have cash controls, there's reasons why you have committees, there's reasons why there's governance, there's reasons why things are organized the way they are and why there are regulations, and they look at you and roll their eyes. So I think it's partially people are learning lessons all over again. Right, right. And Chris, to, uh, to turn over to you, I was most interested in what you, were, what you were seeing on the trading side. I know, you know BCB does a lot more than just that, but uh, you had some, some insights on um, what's been breaking down on the trading side. Yeah, I mean, uh, on the trading side, obviously, uh, so part of what we do is we trade crypto for our clients and trade FX. Uh, <clears throat> so we're exposed to the markets like everyone else. Uh, it's been interesting, obviously, from a, from a banking and payments perspective, you know, nothing changes there for us. We, we provide banking and payment services to, to most of the crypto industry. And on the trading side, um, you know, like anyone else here who trades the market, you know, there's both good and bad. Volatility is good for our trading team, uh, so they're, they're active in the market, uh, but also then the risk position changes, right, in the current, current um, sort of market climate. Right. Camilla, what's your perspective on that? On, on trading in the markets yeah. at the moment? Um, you know, I would say, you know, for Anchorage, we have a, a sort of a, an agency trading business, but I think um, a couple of points in the last panel were raised that are really interesting around the market structure for trading. And I think there's a lot of room for evolution in terms of, again, this issue with, with centralized exchanges and having to pre-fund trades. Um, so I think uh, one of the big uh, focuses, which predates some of the recent uh, turbulence in the markets and I think will accelerate, is really re-evaluating market structure and finding solutions so that existing players in the market and new entrants on the institutional side um, can trade and, and not have to pre-fund on these exchanges, which also uh, bring a lot of credit risk as well. So I think that's going to be yeah. uh, a hot topic of focus that we're all looking to build towards. So I reviewed a fund within the last two months, and, and I'm trying to understand who some of the counterparties are. They had 42 different trading counterparties, many which I knew, some which I didn't. And like most good ODD people, you start with Google and you try to figure it out from there. And I realized that they were trading with individuals who were some of the people who founded some of the coins 10, 15 years ago. So in order to get liquidity, some of those people are trading their mountains of coins um, or, or selling futures or options against them. And, and I'm sitting there trying to think, would it ever be possible to name, I don't know, some big hedge fund and they want to trade Microsoft. So they've directly reached out to Bill Gates and they're going to trade and use Bill Gates as a personal counterparty as opposed to Goldman, Morgan, Merrill, or one of the other big banks. Um, and then I dug deeper, and they were uncollateralized trades. So they have futures and swaps that are uncollateralized. And I'm like, well, what if it goes against this very wealthy person, and they tell you to go bug off, and they're not going to sell you, they're not going to settle. And they just shrug their shoulders. So I mean, it's that type of trading that I'm seeing. And this was a billion, five hundred million dollar manager. They're, they're not a, like a $20 million manager, it's a, over a billion and a half dollar manager, and they're trading directly with um, non-institutional individuals, uncollateralized OTC. So I mean, that type of, call it exuberance, call it 
um, unnecessary trade risk. That's the kind of stuff I'm seeing replete um, in certain global funds. Yeah, I mean, the, the crypto market is a fragmented market. And obviously there'll be players out there that, <clears throat> that will want to trade across multiple venues, arbitrage, etc. Uh, but when you're servicing clients, I mean, from our perspective, we're very careful about the counterparties that we trade with. And we have a very limited set of counterparties, carefully selected. Um, it's not just the trading side, it's also the custody side. Um, and, you know, we look at every partner through a lens of risk, uh, through a lens of, you know, the size of that partner as well. Uh, so there'll be big exchanges out there that we will not trade with. Um, but yeah, that's just from a BCB perspective. Kenga, did you have something yeah, to add I mean, there? Yeah. On our side, on the data side, obviously, that, that supports everything in the infrastructure, we have, we, we share the same view, right? Where we need to make sure that we understand the price formation, we understand the quality of the data that we're providing. So where we, we select exchanges that we're, we're using data from, so we have a very significant, you know, kind of model around these these types of activities. We understand what the anomalies are. So the data, when it comes out of Luca, it actually is a useful data for counting purposes, reporting purposes, but also for trading purposes. So you do have that that level of complexity, clear and transparent to everyone. So I think that's what's going to happen in the industry that people are, will rely more and more on institutions that actually provide that clarity, transparency, accuracy around these things so that they can really trust and move into the market. That's what really hinders the institutional adoption at this point, right? It's, it's, it's the infrastructure is, is a little different than what people are used to. They need to get that trust in the system that the pricing, the reporting, the, the trading, everything that like you don't have these types of situations where you want collateralized loans because it, it really gives a bad rap to everyone. And we collectively who are developing the institutional framework, that's what we're working on to educate people, understand how the crossover comes from traditional into crypto. A lot of us come from traditional finance. I myself come from traditional finance. We're, we talk to CFOs, CEOs explaining how this works, how the infrastructure works, and how can you make it better. There are bad actors everywhere in, in the traditional finance world, we also know them. And there, there are good actors everywhere, and I think we, the, the industry right now is motivated to get through their next phase and, and get, that, get over the hum to get the infrastructure created all across the board with custodians and with us data providers and, and reporting and software providers to, to enable everyone to access it in a responsible way, in an auditable way, in a regulated way. And I would add to that list auditors and administrators. I can't tell you how many administrators we communicate with and they're not reconciling with the managers on a daily basis. They're doing it month end, uh, sort of a nav light type of a settlement. Um, they may be getting in files weekly and doing weekly analytics um, as opposed to daily analytics. Um, the concept of a, of a wallet address, which is provided to an administrator. If, if I'm a really bad guy and I want to be a criminal, and I saw this in private credit, where in private credit you can use an asset and you can pledge it to different um, creditors. What's from stopping a really uh, malicious manager from um, having three different funds with three different administrators and uh, giving them all the same wallet addresses, saying that I am actually running three funds when in, they're not. And, and they're effectively tripled their AUM by saying that wallet is with fund one. They go to the next administrator and say that wallet's with fund two. And they go to the third administrator and say that wallet's with fund three. Turns out it's only one wallet and all three of them are using it as part of NAV for three different funds. Again, I'm not suggesting that's happening, but that kind of, it doesn't happen at Merrill Lynch because the XYZ fund name is on the account. And, and so there's that, that direct connection between the account and the assets. Um, I, I'm just concerned that some of these funds in unique markets and unique places that are purposely going around um, regulations, going around structures, putting, um, organizing their funds in Mauritius and other strange places could be doing bad things that are going to have a domino effect. Yeah. So I, it's bad people doing bad things I could worry me. And I think even if it's not malicious, I think, again, the point is about the range of service providers that are available, right? So if you have the hedge fund communities now growing, maybe crypto-native, 
you know, it's still hard to get good fund administrators, good auditors. Again, prime brokerage is sort of still a little bit of a, a mix and match of different, of different offerings that you're putting together out there. And, you know, I've worked um, with managers and proprietary trading desks who are definitely not doing anything malicious, but don't have an auditor for their financials. So when you're making credit risk decisions, it's very challenging. And then I think, again, it's just, it's, it's just an evolution of this infrastructure and marketplace so everyone can make better decisions. I think we still have a long way to go. And I think a lot of the household name auditors and accountants are still starting to build out practices, but are not broadly available to all of the different participants. And I recently saw my first fund that was set up as a Cayman Charitable Trust. Um, and the Cayman Charitable Trust was used to avoid ECI and UBTI issues. For a U.S. onshore LP, they set up a Cayman Charitable Trust, and then they loaned the money from the Cayman Charitable Trust to uh, the uh, segregated portfolio company. And I'm just trying to understand all the different risk um, elements that are involved. So people are going to come up with strange ways. Maybe it's poor, poor lawyer. Uh, advice, I don't know, but people are are scrambling to try to get around regulations and tax issues and coming up with unique ideas that may not last. Yeah, well, in that case, I think they just didn't get the right advice in the first place, and then they're surprised. They should have talked to you. But there's well. definitely <laughs> clarity around accounting, you know, the, the FASB and the regulators coming in and, and, and giving transparency and clarity around how do you accounting in the industry, right? And and giving giving the legitimacy of talking about these issues in an in a in an in an adult manner, right? So at, at this point, you know, regulators are still catching up with where we are. I think with the the Loomis bill, we're 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 getting closer because I think we we're pointing out the right the right topics, but you know, it still has to catch up with DeFi. It has to catch up with the the advancement in industry. As you said earlier, you know, five years for us is 50 years in another industry, right? For uh, for them, you know, they need to be able not just to 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 understand what's going on today, but but anticipate what is going to happen five years from now. It's incredibly hard because even yeah. it, it's incredibly hard for us as well. You know. And that's, and that's just it. I mean, the regulators have been waiting in the wings here for the crypto industry. I was speaking to somebody who worked for the Fed when they were coming up with their white paper. And they took incredible pains to make sure that they weren't disrupting the industry because they didn't want retail investors to be the bag holders. Well, now that the, now that the crash has come, I think they won't have quite the same reluctance to jump in. And you know, another story I've heard from regulators is, look, didn't we just have a financial crisis not that long ago involving issues of transparency of people that had interlocking relationships that we couldn't identify and that we had to sort out um, issues with custody and Ponzi schemes and things like that? Didn't we just learn those lessons? Um, and, you know, the answer is, I mean, the, the industry you know, has new entrants all the time. And so we do see that, that kind of behavior of, of new entrants thinking. Yeah, but nobody would use this tool, this beautiful tool, this beautiful code that I've created for nefarious purposes. Um, that just won't happen. Um, but particularly in the custody side, we've seen it happen a few times. Uh, maybe not exactly the, the fund, ne nefarious fund manager using the same wallet for three different funds, but, uh, but there have been instances of, uh, of theft uh, where the controls just weren't there. How do you spot that? What do you do about that? So fund managers that are leaving their assets pre predominantly on exchange, um, I think we all recognize that exchanges are, are predominantly where the thefts occur, whether it's traditional exchange or DeFi exchange. Um, so if you're a quantitative high-frequency trader you're, today, you're, the only way to do that is to leave your assets on an exchange. Um, and so therefore the pressure becomes on the selection of this change and which exchanges have custodian protocols and which do not. But unfortunately, some of the managers are choosing their exchanges based on settlement terms that, that may be excessive settlement terms, leverage, um, rebates, and, and other reasons. And, and custody and safety is a secondary or tertiary um, select criteria. And therefore, they open themselves up to bad actors. Most of the, of the uh, thefts have been on exchange. Um, and it's 
you know, it's happened on some of the larger exchanges, but it's also happened to many of the smaller, less well-known exchanges. And I think that's the due diligence that the managers are doing on the exchanges to truly understand the exchanges, I think is light. Yeah. I, I, think I think might just add, though, I, Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I, th I think also this, you know, institutional adoption is driving change. It's driving a different decision-making process and demanding... Um, these different services from, from different service providers and different behavior from exchanges. So, for example, um, you know, being able to, to trade out of custody on these different exchanges to, to do post-trade uh, post settlement instead of um, putting capital on exchanges. You know, the larger these institutions come into the space are demanding this, whereas before I think a lot of crypto native and early entrants into the space were having to learn to live with the sort of, I guess, inferior market structures. So I think clients are demanding it and hopefully we'll all rise to the challenge to build for them. Right. And what I was going to say about that is I think the industry itself has the responsibility to, to step up and we collectively have the responsibility to step up and create the transparency around exchanges and create a process where we're vetting them and make it clear to everyone who, who is there to understand that this, this exchange is not the one that you should be trading with and if you are, do that on, at your own risk. I think transparency is a lot more not more helpful than, you know, strict regulations, right, that can really, you know, mess with the with innovation in the industry because we're still getting $50 billion a year in the industry. That is incredible amount of, of power to do good, right? And I think because a couple of bad actors doesn't mean that we have to stop and the entire industry. What we collectively have the ability to to make sure that people understand what we're dealing with. We are the ones in, ahead of the innovation. We are the ones creating the protocols. We are the ones who understand how trading works. We have to be also the ones educating everyone. We also have to be the ones vetting everyone and making sure that bad actors get weed out instead of the asking the regulator to step in. Yeah. yeah, I was just gonna pick up on a point that John made prior to BCB. Uh, I was at a large exchange, I ran the corporate business uh, at that exchange. Uh, so we had a mixture of clients, you know, all the market makers, traders, etc. Uh, it was interesting. Mostly the conversation was around price. No one ever asked us about how, do, how are you custodying, you know, how settlement working, etc. The only clients that started asking that were large corporates that were coming in during the Elon Musk, uh, Mike Strachey initial. So and we had large corporates wanting to to buy big chunks of Bitcoin. They spent most of the time wanting to know about security, custody, you know, what happens in the event of things going wrong, uh, even before they, you know, started trading with us. So that, just on a point you were making, John. Just a suggestion is, there's a lot of podcasts out there and the podcasts are mostly written, uh, dominated by people with um, new technology, um, new managers, um, I think there would be really helpful to have the podcast on the back end, the traders, the custodians, the data providers, so that the, the due diligence community can get um, well informed so we know which exchanges are good exchanges, which um, protocols are good protocols. And then I think the, the good thing about ODD is it sort of carries, carries the message out to the space. So you talk to a hedge fund manager, why are you doing it that way? You know, the best practices are to do it this way, and you begin to influence managers to assume industry best practices to doing things the right way, to acting the right way. One of our normal questions is, do you trade privacy coins? Are you doing arbitrage in privacy coins? Why? I mean, if people shunned the privacy coins, perhaps the way they should, they wouldn't be as common. Yeah, we're, we're at Luca actually provide our methodology. We have a white paper out there that describes the, the, the methodology for that very reason. We've had every single exchange we're, we're transacting with. We have price and anomaly studies. So we're, we're, we're in a forefront, I would say, to, to make sure that people like you and everyone else has, has the transparency and has the understanding of which exchange to go to, what, what's driven by that exchange, how is, we, we do an incredible amount of, of due diligence on them to make sure that they can enter into our, into our pricing system and create data out of their, their transactions. So I, I do think that, that there is the willingness out there to, to make sure that everyone sees everything and we we're, we're keep working on this. We already, 
In our reference data covers about 42,000 asset pairs already, so we, we have a vast amount of knowledge, but the knowledge grows, keeps growing by the day, right? So it's, it's hard to catch up with it as well. As, as much as we'd like to be covering everything, you know, everybody has to sort of do their own work, including those new fund managers and new technologists. Yeah, I think it might just, to pick up on one thing you said mentioned, that it's actually interesting on the protocols themselves. So for example, Anchorage for our custody business, we're a federally chartered bank overseen by the OCC. So we have an OCC approved approval process for listing new tokens on the platform. So again, I think it's helpful for investors and allocators to understand that any asset on some of these platforms has gone through due diligence. And actually, we've looked at the technology, looked at the founders, looked at the, the you know, the, the whole protocol to make sure that it, it suits, you know, it fits with the framework yeah. uh, as well. It, and I think this goes to your point, King. I mean, I, I think there are parts of the infrastructure that have to be regulated. Things like custody, things like, you know, that those banking relationships. Transparency, there needs to be a minimum level of transparency um, and if it's not provided by the market, you cannot have a sponsor of a coin that's still involved in the operations of the coin trading against the coin without, you know, where they're coming from a big position. I mean, that, that is not a way for an efficient market to, to work. But if there are ways to provide that information without having the SEC come in and say, look, we're going to make everybody f file a 13D on their, uh, on, you know, on their tokens. Yeah, I'm, I'm very open to that, but I just don't see how we can have um, some of the off-chain trading be permissible when you, I mean, it kind of, it, and it comes back down to, you know, are these things securities or not? And, you know, none of us really want them to be securities, but there's a lot of security-like behavior at issuers, and there's a lot of hidden fees that are very reminiscent of, you know, other exchanges and things like that, that you know, the markets have had to address through regulation. And if we can find a way to regulate ourselves, so much the better. And I think the good data, that, you know, that's, a, that's something that could help us avoid some of that regulation. However, you know, again, I, I see the regulators circulating, circling, and I, I think it's coming now. You know, the, the time to have done this would have been two, three years ago. And the responsible regulation obviously is, is, is welcomed by the industry and we want clarity just as much as everybody else, right? I think it's more so, it's not about what we cannot do, it's more about creating rules around the game. Yeah. And I think that's what everyone's welcoming in the industry from, you know, FASB to SEC to CFTC, whoever wants to take the helm. Crypto is complicated, right? You can, it's, not, it's not like FX, it's not like securities. It's, there's at least six different kinds of characteristics around the ones that we're using for transactions, the ones we're using for, for, um, for protocols, like, you know, like the, the Ether transactions around you know, smart contracts and the Web3 ones and the, and the DEXs and the DeFi contracts. There's, there's difficulty around the complexity around and, and, the, and the, the variability of these things, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't attempt to create guidelines around how we deal with it. What we do necessarily disagree with is that, you know, you're, you're creating permissive rules where people have to play by the game and, and you know, to your point around the 13 Ds, you have to file enormous amount of paperwork yeah. and you're still catching up with where things are. And, you know, that's, that's what we're trying to help our, on, on our side as well, is to make sure that we at least have the ability to, to create some sort of a framework for the regulators to understand what are the key issues you have to look at. When you look at an exchange, what's the most important thing? When you look at a protocol, what are you looking for? So that when they create the regulation around this and try to get rid of, rid of the bad actors, they understand exactly what to look for. And I think that's very hard in the crypto space right now to really understand. Right. Yeah, uh, regulation is certainly coming uh, and it's welcomed by the industry. Uh, we're regulated in the UK as a payments business uh, by the FCA uh, and along with a lot of other companies in the UK we're engaging with the regulator on the crypto side doing a lot of work there uh, also with government ministers so we had government ministers come and visit us our offices the other day you know what they're trying to understand is you know what is this thing you know there's a lot of education that needs to be go on, go on at that level as well certainly in the UK and I'm sure that's elsewhere um, but then there's also regulatory environments that are already set up. So uh, we, uh, prior to Christmas, purchased a German bank. So that German bank is becoming part of our group. 
So we'll be subject to regulation in Germany by Baffin. And there you've got well-established crypto regulation, uh, a brokerage license or, or a custody license in Germany. So it's well thought through and it's well executed in Germany. Um, I think the one thing, though, with regulation globally, being a business that serves customers around the world, uh, is that you've got fragmented regulation. And so certainly from an industry perspective, it would be good to see you know, some cohesion on that, on that regulation and some unification. So, yeah. You know, but fra fragmentation is a problem that we have. Okay, the, the story of Dodd-Frank was that it was going to help the world harmonize the uh, financial markets. It's done exactly the opposite. So we've, we now have national regimes where once we had a little bit of, of comedy, um, comedy, not comedy, because uh, none of this is all that funny. Um, but, you know, the, the promise of, of harmonization is just always out there, out of reach. Um, but we live with it in the security space. We live with it in the commodity space. I think the reason we can't live with it yet in the crypto space is because the regulators have taken such different approaches. I love the approach in Switzerland where they just said, this is not a security. Full stop. I wish our regulators could be that clear. Instead, we get, you know, the bill from last week. Uh, this, is, this will be treated as a commodity unless it's treated as a, as a security. Well, thanks, guys. And if I'm not mistaken, in the beginning of June, um, the Southern District of New York filed their first insider trading claim on an NFT. So the, the old school rules and regs are still being uh, applied to front running, insider trading, um, fraud, mismanagement, um, not managing your fraud, uh, your, your fund the right way opens you up to certain um, regulatory issues because the SEC, if you're managing other people's money and you're a US manager or an FCA manager, you're got, you still have to play within the rules. Those are still out there and then the harmonization is gonna help. I mean, I take the, the opposite view a little bit on this one because I think crypto is in an early stage as far as community has been around for a while, right? For us, there needs to be some sort of experimentation, right? So I, I don't think it's a good idea to dictate to others how the, the market should look like. I think we need to experiment with regulation, see which one works, and then people will emulate it. You know, that happens. You know, if it makes something make sense, people generally try tend to kind of go with it. And a little bit of fragmentation helps because you can see which, which environment is the most helpful for everyone in the industry. Yeah, although I think it's been a little while before other countries have really looked to U.S. financial regulation for guidance. It's yeah, I and mean, maybe there's a reason for that. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Camilla, did you have something to add on that? Or? May I guess um, I, w I would just say that you know to, to give everybody here a positive spin on on this industry. There's so much exciting innovation, but there are service providers working really hard and diligently to be a gateway for institutions and again provide the transparency, provide the data, work well with inside the regulatory framework um, to make it accessible to institutions um, and you know enable people to participate in the ecosystem right. in, in, in a right. legitimate way. Well, I didn't just want to talk about the problems of the industry, because I do think there are ways forward. Um, I was saying to John before the panel, you know, I'm still waiting for the ways that crypto will change my role as a, as a funds lawyer and an investment, as, you know, investment management lawyer forever, because I'm sure that it will happen. But I'm just not sure just which parts of this will last. I'm sure, though, a lot of it will. Um, what's the way forward in terms of the infrastructure that we want to develop? And we've talked a little bit about, you know, certain sp uh, strategies to custody, trying to move towards uh, more regulated institutions for custody, maybe some disclosure requirements, something like that, better access to data. What's the, what's the future look like? Oh, I was going to say, it's a big, big question. Uh, uh, I think... Well, maybe we'll start with the current situation. I think we're definitely now forced into a market maturity situation. Uh, and I think someone made the point uh, earlier on a panel about dot-com. Uh, and to me, uh, you know, someone who's sadly old enough to remember that as a young product guy building products for this thing called the internet, that yeah. at the time some people believed in it, other people didn't believe in it. Um, those of us that believed in it were, were, were trying to fathom a way forward and we didn't really understand what the future would look like uh, and I think that's where we are today to some extent but we do know change is coming and has to happen and more rigor and more discipline 
has to come in, and that happened during the dot-com phase. Uh, but the exciting thing, if we want to talk about opportunities, is no one back then imagined that a guy selling books over the internet was going to one day build rocket ships and take us to Mars. And that's kind of the, what I see as the potential, if we want to sort of look to the future. Yes, there's a lot that needs to change in terms of how we go about building things. We, we've got to move away from you know, building things and breaking things and moving to building things that are robust, scalable, yeah. and, and done in a disciplined way. And that's kind of the world I see. Yeah. yeah. I mean, 20 years ago, nobody thought they were going to buy pet food on the internet because, you know, pets.com went bankrupt. But of course you buy pet food from Amazon. You know, it's just a question of which package. So what's the package going to look like, John? I'm not sure I'm the best person to, to look into the future. Um, but the areas that I think would be interesting um, were touched on by some of the earlier panels. Once there is a good workable custody solution. It doesn't have to be from one organization, but that people can generally work with it and understand it, and, and that people can truly rely on it. Um, that will help bring institutions. Um, when there is maturity of regulations, that'll bring in institutions. When um, some of the, the bad actors are pushed out or shunned, that will help. Um, and then lastly, I think Maybe I'm a bit of a naysayer out there, but I think at, at some point um, there has to be a, a crossover between the digital asset space and the non-digital asset space, i.e. the ability to use your, your digital assets to pay for something um, in an easy way. When we have the crossover the same way you can have a, a credit card embedded like an Apple Pay or whatever, that you can have your crypto assets, you can wave your phone and, and you can pay for a dinner um, using digital assets. Um, that's to me will be a big crossover. I know those exist in small places, but when it becomes more common and people can truly say, I can build up wealth in digital assets and I don't have to go through 23 steps to get that digital wealth into my bank account so they can use it to buy a car or a house or something, I think that'll be a bit of a, when it be, truly becomes commonplace to pay with digital assets will be a, a, a big watershed event. That's just my guess. And they already started, actually, if I may add to that. And I think that's the incredible utility of the, of the ecosystem, right? So one could argue we already have TradFi. Why do we need this, right? I think when you look around and, and you go into third world countries where people are, made, are mostly unbanked, and they have the ability to actually transact, build wealth, to your point, and, and have that fractional amount of money that they have, which is, which is immaterial in our country, but it would be extremely material for them, invest and, and build wealth. That unlocks so much value that we have untapped so far that that sort of underpins why we're here and what we're trying to build. And I think that's what everyone in the infrastructure was building infrastructure is trying to figure out for the world to make it really better. I mean, I'm not to kind of lose the cliche, but it is, when we talked about the internet, it was, you know, buying books and reading information, you know, what, who, who needs that? The crypto is the same thing. Like, you know, we're, we're, we're building a, a rail that create, that, that makes, makes payments accessible to everyone. I think everyone needs that. And I think that's the beauty of this thing and trading and the bad actors and all those things will fall out in the end. It starts with why we're here. And I think why we're here is we think that there's a better way. And, and I think once we figured out the better way, you know, everyone's gonna understand it. We're in the beginnings of the journey right now. And I think we're all of us trying to do the right thing here. And most of us trying to do the right thing. And I think with regulations and what the industry innovations, I think we're gonna get there. And we're getting there really fast. The industry innovates in, in an accelerated pace. I guess we'll add a few final comments here. I think you, we probably don't have enough time to talk about all the use cases and all the amazing use cases, which why, is why we've dedicated our careers to this. I think there'll be transformative for financial services, commerce, there's so many different applications. Um, and I think we're at the stage, again, regulatory and otherwise, you know, so much the complexity we're working on will be abstracted away for users. If anyone wants to use their Coinbase wallet and you see transaction hashes and all of these things, I think in a few years, you won't even look at that. You won't even see any of that. It's so early on in the industry and it's, it's exciting, but yeah, we have definitely a lot of issues that we need to, um, to work through. You know, as a, as a consumer, I want simple things. I don't want it to take three days for the check, uh, check to clear. 
I you know, want to be able to engage in a real estate transaction with fewer uh, hurdles. I want to be able to maybe buy precious metals or you know, carbon credits or whatever. Um, all of these assets that are hard to trade, but that are really fungible, fundamentally fungible um, in some ways, I just I don't understand why we can't cut through some of the, uh, you know, this is this is a use case, um, and uh, you know, being able to trust the market infrastructure around it is is one of the impediments to sort of broader adoption and institutional adoption. Um, I think uh, any last uh, and last thoughts uh, as we wrap up here. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think we, we broadly covered covered it. Again, we'd like to remind everyone that we have an incredible range of service providers who are doing their best to, to build a great infrastructure and improve the market structure and work with regulators and bring best-in-class technology to the space. I'm, you know, despite the last few weeks, I've been through a few cycles myself. I've been in crypto for four years, remarkably bullish. Uh, now is the time to build and focus on the fundamentals. I guess just the, it's very... Um self-serving but i mean there's there's good managers and there's bad there's good institutions there's bad we talked about that and and um i think once institutions can get comfortable with the the space the markets and the assets are going to flow into the space um and there's going to be a lot of work for due diligence folks like myself to get there but we'll push and prod the organ uh, the uh, industry in the right directions and and, w and once the uh, the spigots opens up there's going to be there's trillions of, of, ass, of dollars in assets, I think, that want to flow in. They just need to get comfortable with the industry. So the work of, of these three people around me that are, are hard in this area are going to be the difference, whether it happens or doesn't. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it, it's a market with, you know, huge opportunity. We all, we're all in it because we believe in a future of, uh, you know, new financial sort of set of products that, that consumers can uh, and corporates can utilize. Uh, I think it's a phase where uh, those of us who are grown-ups in the room are going to take on even more, and it's going to be a period where you know uh, people are going to look for the grown-ups. Um, I also think uh, I said this on a panel uh, at Permissionless. We were asked a question about what do today's five-year-olds, uh, what will the world look like for today's five-year-olds, uh, and I talked about um, well, they won't call it crypto; they just call it money. And so we're building a new system that's just going to be running the world's money on the internet. Oh, that's, that's, that's aptly said. And I also want to echo Camilla's view around um, our time to build, right? We're, it is time to build for us as well. Make sure that we can follow what the industry trends are and create more transparency so that everyone can enjoy and understand the industry and institutionals are not afraid of joining us and, and, and really create this new world revolution when money is going to be money, not crypto versus fiat. Right. Well, I think there you have it. In that sense, uh, there are a lot of problems, but uh, one of the things I was saying to the panelists that I like about this panel is there actually are solutions within our, within our grasp. There are solutions that people are already working on, um, and you know, we're well in the process of fixing the things that need to be p fixed. It may take some time, but, uh, but we know what the answers are at a, uh, at a macro level. Uh, Thank you. Thank you.